This video is sponsored by Autodesk, a design and make company, and Incogni. More on them later. A year ago, I completed a dream build of mine, this adorable little teardrop camper. Since then, I've traveled nearly 5,000 miles in her all up and down the West Coast to some of the most beautiful places I have ever seen. She even survived a road that ripped the entire exhaust pipe off my car without even a scratch. My favorite part of the design is by far the beautiful stargazer window. It's really hard to capture on camera, but this is my view as I'm falling asleep. I also love the symmetrical breezeway doors that allow wind and views all the way through, easy charging inside, and tons of cabinet storage for extra blankets and clothes and toiletries. But the one downside, and some of you called me out in my first video for this, is that I never really finished the kitchenette area. Not only that, but I despised the structural design of the back galley hatch from the beginning, and so after a year of tolerating it, I tore the entire hatch off and went back to the drawing board. The things I wanted to do were eliminate the head injury factor from bonking your head on the sharp bottom corner, not that I would have ever done that, and to make better use of the space with drawers and slide outs, especially the weird unusable triangular space under the counter. Luckily, I had 5,000 miles of driving and seething over my previous crappy design to brainstorm something better. So to start off, I opened up my trusty CAD software, Fusion 360, and got cracking. Now with CAD, it is so easy to model a bunch of parts onto my existing trailer model, and that makes sure that the curves will match and everything will fit together perfectly. And Fusion makes it so simple to project complex curves from an existing piece onto new sketches, and I had to do a ton of that with this redesign. And I'm not gonna lie, Fusion 360 saved me from myself a bunch of times during the design process. It is so much easier and cheaper to mess around with parts in the digital world and find out that they don't work or that an idea is garbage than to waste a bunch of plywood and time finding that out down the line. And also, since I have the privilege of cutting all of these curved structure supports on a CNC machine, the workflow is so easy in Fusion 360. The really great thing about Fusion 360 is that the cam is built right in. So when I'm done with the design, I can just tab over to the manufacturing tab and set up my toolpaths for the Tormach CNC in the same software. And not only that, but working on this project, I discovered this super sweet nesting arrange tool where the software will actually like arrange all of your parts perfectly optimized for your CNC bed size, which means you don't have to do any thinking for yourself, which is really great and also helps save a ton of plywood, which costs a bajillion dollars a sheet right now. So once all of that is done, I can send it over to my friend, Terry the Tormach, who made super quick work of the job. And her googly eyes are still in the mail, but don't worry, they are coming. With all of my parts in hand, it was time to assemble the hatch. I found the quickest way to process cut plywood is to just knock all the fluffies off the edges with a sanding sponge. So I did that. And then I took a leaf out of the Bolt Builders handbook that I learned building the sailboat to reinforce all of my structural pieces. So I mixed up some Bottle Tote, silica thickened epoxy, and added pink glitter, of course, for some pizzazz, and glued all of my hatch pieces together. Now, every single one of these pieces is doubled. So that includes the CNC cut curves, as well as all the horizontal straight pieces that I just cut on the table saw. And I opted to use all laminated plywood instead of any two x four lumber this time, because last time they just warped a lot. So this will avoid warping and add a lot of strength. The next morning I popped all the clamps off and sanded off all of that excess epoxy. And then I realized that I fluffed it up. At like two in the morning last night, I glued I glued these on backwards, so like these had to be glued in inverse. And I didn't do that, I don't know if you can see. Uh, so these two should have been flipped. So my solution was to cut the longer part off of one of them and then go back to the CNC and cut two more curved pieces, one of the long ones and one of the short ones. And then those exterior curves are just gonna be three pieces thick. So extra strength, extra fun, no harm, no foul. I glued those up and sanded them and I was back on track. With all of the pieces processed, I was able to start assembling the hatch. And my friends Ben and Jenna came over to help me push the trailer into the garage for the weekend, since of course, I took the roof off right before a hurricane rolled into LA, of all things. So they had fun helping me put these pieces together before we hunkered down in the rain. And honestly, because I designed everything in CAD and Fusion 360 ahead of time, with the exception of my little glue up oopsie, everything went together so, so fast. For all the horizontal braces, I assembled them with pocket holes that are on the face that gets covered by the plywood and aluminum, so they'll be completely hidden. And no one will know that I used pocket holes, other than this video on the internet. With the frame skeleton fully assembled, it was time to skin it. 
and this went super quickly with extra hands, so we cut the wiggle wood to shape, and this plywood is specially glued up so that all of the grain runs in the same direction, so it's really easy to bend in one direction and not the other. And then glued one edge down carefully, screwed it in place, and then worked our way around the curve. I wanted to reuse as much of the old hatch as possible, so we carefully removed all of the trim, hardware, and aluminum skin and cleaned it off for its nice second life. Once the plywood skin was cleaned up, so I trim routed any overhang off and then gave it a good sanding, it was time for the aluminum exterior skin. We used a healthy amount of liquid nails and a whole lot of clamps and only a few choice swear words to get this on and centered and square. And the annoying part was the old hatch wasn't perfectly square, so the aluminum piece that we pulled off of it was a little bit rhombus shaped, but we figured the trim on the sides would cover a little bit of those gaps, and it did. And the hurricane hinge that we rescued off the old hatch helped hold one edge down with screws every four inches, and then we could work our way down the other side. Okay, trimming the aluminum down while the liquid nails was still wet sucked so much, except it was really late and we were really motivated to get it mounted to the trailer while Trevor was still here helping out because that extra height was like really, really helpful. So we clamped it super well and with the clamps still on it, we slid it onto the other side of the hurricane hinge. The next morning, Karis got the hatch final sanded and gave it a couple coats of Halcyon by Bodal Tote. Oh, and also I conned Total Boat into making Bodal Tote my affiliate code. So you can use Bodal Tote at checkout for 5% off your total order. And I've linked all the, the products that I use down in the description. Anyway, I really like the look of Halcyon on birch plywood specifically because it's clear and so it doesn't stain it amber. It just leaves it really light, which is the contrast that I wanted from that cherry, like dark amber backdrop of the kitchenette. So once the aluminum edges were trim routed flush, we could get the trim onto the hatch. And so the wide aluminum trim bends really easily over those curves and the wide flat area of it will press against the gasket holding the galley water tight. So with all those trim pieces mitered and dry fitting nicely, we could screw them on with a healthy amount of sealant in there to prevent any water from seeping in and rotting that wood frame. These gas springs came compressed, which is terrifying. So I have to like cut all these zip ties off. I'm so scared. Now I made a lot of gas strut mistakes on the last hatch design, but what I've learned is that you want to place the strut pretty close to the hinge on the trailer side and then further from the hinge on the hatch side. So that means that when the hatch is closed, the struts are actually helping push it closed rather than fighting the latch and trying to push it open while it's closed. Um, and so I used this really lovely gas strut calculator that another true drop builder made, and I'll link that down in the description below. And I gotta say, even if you did the math, it still feels pretty magical when the gas struts actually work. Oh my God, I'm so excited. The gas struts actually work and they're like, And then to reduce the head injury risk a little bit more, I rounded over the miters a bit and added gaskets to the faces. For that lower awkward area that I wanted to make better use of, and yes, I am going out of order a little bit here to make the video more understandable, so like you've already seen what it looks like. Um, I started in Fusion 360 and projected a bunch of those weird curves onto a new drawer piece. And then I ported my designs over to the Tormach where I cut out the sidewalls and the center piece. And then I cut the back plate out on the table saw and drilled a bunch of pocket holes that will be in the back of the drawer so they won't be visible once they're assembled either. I don't know if you're noticing a trend here. Um, and then I cut the base of the drawer with an angle to meet the trailer's curve and prepped it with some futurely invisible pocket holes and got the drawer assembled. Now the wiggle wood was a bit of a challenge to skin myself since there wasn't anywhere to clamp to, but I used a nail gun to pin pieces down and it went okay. Since the bottom edge of this drawer faces the road, I got really nervous about wear and tear and rocks getting kicked up and stuff, and I decided to fiberglass it. And I also painted the entire thing inside and outside with epoxy just out of fear of water damage, which was probably excessive, but definitely doesn't hurt. For the sides, I trimmed it the same way that I did the top hatch with that really wide aluminum trim that smushes against the gaskets. And then for the top edge, I just glued and screwed on a really nice piece of ash that the gasket on the top hatch can meet against and hold it watertight. And that piece also adds a little bit of really nice structural rigidity. Okay, before we put the thing on, I have to put a little friend in <laughs> so that, <laughs> like right there, I think. He's like excited to say hi. 
This whole odd drawer thing mounts to the bottom with a really long piano hinge and then latches to the sides with spring-loaded barrel bolts that poke into holes drilled on the side of the trailer's interior wall. And then once everything is latched and locked and fit as desired, we went through and put all of the rest of the piano hinge screws in. This adventure may have an eye-catching and unique shape, but in general, as a young woman on the internet, it's really important for me to stay private and incognito most of the time. And that gets harder and harder as the industry around buying and selling personal information collected online gets bigger. And that brings us to the wonderful sponsor of today's video, Incogni. I've had strangers find my home address, information about my parents, and information about my loved ones, and that's personal info that should be just mine. Thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and trading your personal data without you knowing anything about it. You have the right to request data brokers to delete what information they have about you, except it would take you years, and it would take me a whole lot of snacks, to do it manually. Incogni can do the messy work for you by automatically reaching out to data brokers on your behalf, requesting your personal data removal, and dealing with their objections. Signing up was super easy. I did it right from my phone while I was on the road, and as I was still adding information, Incogni was already finding my information and sending dozens of removal requests. It's kind of shocking just how many data brokers are out there holding onto your very personal information. Everything from your home addresses and phone numbers to your relatives and your social security number and even your shopping habits. Use my code FOXLIN at incogni.com slash FOXLIN to get 60% off an annual plan. By clicking that link below, you can get a year of Incogni for just $6.50 a month, and I'm telling you, in just a week, Incogni found my information and started pulling it off of nearly 200 broker sites. So go to incogni.com slash FOXLIN and use code FOXLIN to get my exclusive offer of 60% off. Plus, you're supporting my channel by supporting my sponsor. That's incogni.com slash FOXLIN, or click the link below to take your personal data off the market. Thanks again to Incogni and Autodesk for making huge projects like this possible. Now let's get back to building an eye-catching trailer. The other thing I needed to take care of was the doors. Y'all may recall that when I built the trailer, I fiberglassed the sidewalls of the trailer itself, but I didn't get around to fiberglassing the doors. And I told myself that I would, and then I was too exhausted and burnt out and time constrained, and I just didn't get around to it. And now it's a pretty good demo of how effective fiberglass is because the walls look brand new, but these doors are unfortunately showing a lot of water damage. So I took them down, took all the trim off and sanded all of the varnish off all the way down to bare wood. And on this door, the bottom was water damaged enough that I decided to try sanding all of the cherry veneer off and patching it. Although I can't really decide if that was the move. So let me know what you think down in the comments because I actually didn't do that on the other door. So I decided to leave one water damaged door and one patched door and you know, that's what we did. <laughs> and also these doors are all fiberglass with scraps from the sailboat. So keep all of your scraps friends cause you can always find a use for them. Like always, I spent longer smoothing the fiberglass down and making sure it looked good dry before going in with my epoxy. And then after a few hours when the epoxy was green, I went in with another flood coat to fill the weave and fully hide the texture of the glass. And once that was cured, I could sand it smooth and finally revarnish. And you may notice that I'm using Bottle Tote Gleam 2.0 instead of Lust, which is my usual varnish, but that's just because I ran out of Lust and it was still in the mail. <laughs> um, but they're very similar varnishes. Gleam is just a thinned down version of Lust. Before getting the doors back on, I replaced the window gaskets, I screwed the windows back on, replaced all of the aluminum trim around the outside, and this time I used sealant. Last year I didn't use sealant because I wasn't sure if I would have to take the doors off, you know, to fiberglass them. Um, and that was really dumb and likely the cause for most of the water damage, like water getting into the trim and not being able to really escape on the bottom of the doors. Um, so once I sealed it, it was time to get the doors back on. What time is it? If I ran with this, would that make me a door dasher? First things first, I refinished what was already there in the kitchenette. So I sanded all of the paint and old varnish. I also fixed some of the veneer spots that I tore off to poison termites during the swarm last year. Did you know that once a year termites get wings and they just move in everywhere and you have to like poison them and chase them around? Anyway, that was terrible. So I patched that and I revarnished and painted to make everything nice and fresh. For the sliding drawer system, I started in Fusion 360, which meant building it was super easy since I already had a cutlass ready to go. 
and it also meant that I caught a design mistake before I fabricated it. I actually cut the first few pieces, or I'm not supposed to tell you this, before I finished modeling it in Fusion and started questioning the fit. And so I ran back to my computer, I modeled it in Fusion 360 and realized that indeed, the drawer system was going to interfere with the curve of the hatch. But luckily, digitally, it's super easy to make adjustments. And so I bumped everything from three quarter to half inch ply to keep weight and space down. I changed some dimensions of the storage of the drawer. And then I assembled in real life with no issues and lots of quick and easy pocket holes. This telescoping design is based on a handful of overlanding truck bed campers that I saw. I was basically just trying to optimize counter space since I feel like that's always what I'm looking for when I'm cooking, like both camping and at home. Oh, and folks on Instagram have expressed some concern about these slides, but do not worry, these linear slides are rated to 260 pounds, and yes, I have already cooked a big honkin' pot of spaghetti, and it was super strong, it could take the weight, no problem. Before assembling, I painted all of the side surfaces with exterior paint and then veneered the front faces with the same cherry veneer that the kitchenette is veneered in, so it all matches nicely. And my last step once the unit was assembled was I covered the top in a scrap piece of anodized aluminum, like the same stuff that's on the outside of the trailer. And actually, this is the piece that I cut out of the skylight. It just happened to fit perfectly on the top of this. Um, so it ties the look together, but it also makes a surface that I can put a hot pot like, like right off the stove or off the fire straight onto so like super convenient and that aluminum is just epoxied straight onto the wood with total bit thick so and then once that cured I just trim routed around it and I could install the whole unit into the kitchenette with some L brackets for the pullout organizer storage tray, I designed and laser cut some little trays that both hold the cutting board surface flush to the top of the drawer and also give me a really easy place to store spices and utensils and like knives and camping stuff in there. And then for the countertop that goes on top of that, I decided to make a large removable cutting board that can serve as counter space if it's in place, a cutting board also fits in place or somewhere else, or a tray that moves around the campsite. And so it's entirely made of scraps that I had lying around, the main one being all of the remainder of the cherry board that I made all of the trim in the trailer out of. So I really wanted to like tie the cherry back into the kitchen. Woo! Okay, let's go find out if this fits before I like sand it and make it all nice. <laughs> Moment of truth. And with the robot having done most of the work, all I had to do is give it a quick sanding and a once over with Total Boat Wood Honey to finish it, and it was ready to go. Okay, so if I'm not the queen of scope creep, I don't know who is, but I ordered some fold down legs for that cutting board so that it could be used as a tray table around camp, but then I decided that they were too big and took up too much space in the organizer drawer. But as I was staring at them in my shop, I realized that it would be really easy to make a custom sized table that fit perfectly into the lower drawer section so it would like store almost invisibly. So I cut a piece of three quarter inch plywood, rounded over the edges, slapped some beautiful halcyon varnish on there, screwed the legs on, added a snap for it to get snapped into the drawer, and I was done. Scope creep. Not gonna lie, this is pretty great. So you just, you need your table, you can open the drawer, and then this just unsnaps. Yeah. Little table, and then when you're done, you just fold it back in, put it in here, and snap it in place. I've been putting this off for a really long time because I really don't want to drill a hole in my perfectly good hatch, but alas, adulthood. To put the hatch lock on, I drilled a hole for the T-handle to slide through, sealed all of the newly exposed wood with epoxy, and then just screwed the handle on. The unit with the bar locks that actually locks the hatch just attaches onto the back, and then I drilled holes in the side of the trailer for those bars to slide into um, to like engage the lock. And then the last thing to do is just replace all of the stickers, so we rescued them off the bottom where they used to be that's now covered up. And this time I'm putting them on the upper hatch. So anytime the trailer door is open, I can see all of the amazing places that Misadventure has been. And now that that's done, it is time to take her on the road and collect some new stickers. I'm not heading for the
Now my wheels in motion and my 